But I have here this morning the, the living and powerful Word of God. And I want you to look with me in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. The Bible says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you uh, for your word, for the power of it. We pray, Lord, that your word would now speak to our hearts and that it would uh, fulfill in us all of your purposes for your glory. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It says here, let us draw near. Uh, what happens to a person when they draw near to God? What happens in our lives if we draw near to God? Well, um, one of the things that happens when we draw near to God is that we find joy and eternal pleasure in God's presence. In God's presence, there is not just joy, but, and not just pleasure, but the fullness of joy and the greatest extent of pleasure. In Psalm 16, and verse 11, the Bible says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is the fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forever, forevermore. For the person living in this condition, for a person living in the fullness of joy and in the, in the eternal pleasure of God's presence, all the things of the Christian life that might be uh, on the outside mundane might seem to be routine. All these things are not routine. They're not mundane at all. Every aspect of life takes on a new and a fuller meaning and purpose. It remains fresh and exciting. Uh, the things of God, even the spiritual disciplines of our lives, they remain fresh to the one who draws near to God and is ever forced, or never again forced, to live for Christ. Rather, we do that voluntarily. We do that joyfully because we enjoy His presence and we have great pleasure. Um, so the person who draws near to God has fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Does that sound like something worth it? People will expend great effort and do great destruction to their lives as they seek cheap thrills and they seek pleasures that do not last. And they seek the pleasure in sin, which lasts only for a season, but the Bible says the end thereof is the way of death. And so uh, if people will sell their souls and sell their lives in search of pleasure and in search of thrills and, and happiness, should we not seek to draw near to God who gives us the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore in His presence? He, of course, we don't fully experience that till someday we... The Bible says we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is when we step into the presence of Christ, completely sanctified by him. Um, and so uh, the person who draws near to God experiences that. He also, uh, the person who draws near to God becomes more and more like him, more and more like Jesus Christ. It says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, it is, it, is God's, it is God's goal, it is God's purpose for every Christian to become like Jesus Christ, to become holy, and to become um, so much like the character of Christ. And, and that is something that God will fulfill in us ultimately in eternity but he also desires us to be more and more christ-like as we live here on this earth the bible says in james 4 and verse 8 draw nigh to god and he will draw nigh to you cleanse your hands ye sinners and purify your hearts ye double-minded the person who draws nigh to god cleanses his hands and purifies his heart he, in other words his action his attitudes are are cleansed as he draws nigh to god it is a promise and a work of the spirit we become more like Christ as we draw near to God. So, it's no surprise then, when we look at that, it's no surprise that God desires for us to draw near to Him. That He wants us to do this. How do we know that God wants us to draw near to Him? Well, because He exhorts us to draw near to Him. He commands us to draw near to Himself. And we're going to look now at this full passage in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. The Bible says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which 
he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You see that command in verse 22? We've already talked about it. Let us draw near. God wants us to draw near to himself. And a couple of weeks ago, we, we learned, I'm halfway through this message, and so we're starting the second half. We learned a couple of weeks ago, we, we know God wants us to draw near because he exhorts us to draw near to himself. It's commanded. It requires, this commandment requires something. It requires action on our part. And, it, and, and this command reveals something. It reveals the location in which we draw near to God. That is the heart. It's not a building. It's not, um, it's not some kind of a special place. It is actually in our hearts. That is essential. Drawing near to God is an inside job. We are to draw near with a true heart, it says. Uh, and it is a sure thing. We are to draw near to God with a full assurance of faith. Drawing near to God also is a two-way street. Uh, says by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us he paved the road for us and so if we draw nigh to God he will draw near to us today I want to focus now that's the first reason God God exhorts us to draw near that's how we know he wants us to draw near to him today I want to focus on the second reason we know that God wants us to draw near to himself and that is this God not only exhorts us to draw near but he equips us to draw near he equips us to draw near to himself. I know that God wants me to draw near to himself because God has given me everything that I need in order to do so. There's nothing else. There is no other special knowledge that I need to, to get. There's no pilgrimage I need to make in order to draw near to God. He has given me everything that I need and he has done that for you if you know Christ as your Savior. He, he not only exhorts us to draw near, but God does not leave us alone with that impossible task. No, Jesus equips us to do so. Okay, so what equipment do we get, right? Uh, what does Jesus give us that equips us to draw near to God? I want you to notice a word that occurs three times in our text, in our uh, Bible here. And uh, that word, and by the way, repetition usually means something's important, right? And so the word that reappears here is the word having. It is repeated three times in our text in Hebrews 19, uh, 10, 19 through 22. And in the first place it says, having therefore, brethren, boldness. So we're having boldness. That's one of the things that Jesus has given to us. Boldness to enter the holiest. The second thing is, excuse me, found in verse 21 and having an high priest over the house of God so not only do we have boldness we have a high priest and then having our hearts sprinkled and uh, notice uh, uh, here in the first instance in verse 19 having boldness to enter the holiness having is a uh, a participle all right and and what is a participle we've talked about this a little bit on Wednesday night but a participle is a verbal adjective it's a, it's a verb that acts as an adjective in other words it's a verb um, the, the verb here having modifies it describes well what we have in other words we're not doing something we just we just have something it, it, it's in the present tense in verse 19 in other words this boldness that we have is not something that we used to have and back in the good old days before America you know had left left loving God and and people didn't work on Sunday and all that stuff uh, back in no we didn't, it's not something we had back in the good old days and we don't have now and it's not something that we're going to have someday. We are going to have it someday, but not to the exclusion of having it now. It is something that, that uh, we have right now in Jesus Christ. And we have right now, what is it? Boldness to enter the presence of God into the holiness, holiest of all. And then it says in verse 21, having an high priest over the house of God. Having here is, the, the word having here is actually not in the original language, not in the original Greek, but it is, it is uh, the English word belongs there. It's supplied by our translators. In other words, it, 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 its appearance is warranted because it, it's really coming from that first appearance of the word. In other words, in Greek it says having boldness to enter the holiest, and then it says, and high priest. 
It doesn't say having, it just implies that it's there. All right? And so it's just as strongly, um, we understand it just as strongly to be there. Um, it, it is tied to that phrase. So verse 21 also describes in the present tense. That's what I'm trying to get across to you, all right? It's in the present tense also. And it describes something that we're having right now. We have a high priest that represents us to God. And then the third thing, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience in our body washed with pure water. Um, these three things equip us to draw near to God. Who has these things? Well, verse, verse 19 tells us who has these things. It says, having therefore brethren. All right, having therefore brethren, boldness. Who are the brethren? Well, the term brethren refers to fellow Christians. It, it refers to believers in Christ. And that is the constant meaning of the term brethren throughout the book of Hebrews. Um, in verse 1 of chapter 3, he says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. And he's calling out and, and writing out to believers in Christ who are holy brethren. Why are they holy? Because they're set apart to God. Um, in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, he says, Take heed, brethren, lest, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. And so he's again exhorting the same brethren he was talking to in verse 1. They're holy brethren. And in, in chapter 13, Verse 22, he says, And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty. All right, so he, he, uh, he addresses the, when he says brethren, he is talking to believers in Christ. I know sometimes you might have a brother that is a physical brother, but not a spiritual brother. Well, he's not talking about that. He's talking about spiritual brothers. So Jesus totally equips us to draw near to God, but he gives these things, this equipment, he only gives to his people. He only equips believers in Christ to draw near to God. In other words, you can only draw near to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and there is no other way. To equip us to draw near to God, what does Jesus give us? We talked about it. Uh, briefly, but let, let's examine it a little bit more in detail. Jesus gives us, first of all, holy boldness. Holy boldness to draw near to God. Again, verse 19 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. What is, what is this boldness? What is the meaning of boldness? Boldness translate. Parasia, and, and it means freedom and openness, especially in speech. You know, when you're comfortable around somebody is when you really talk openly, right? Uh, when, and you have that confidence in that person that you can speak to them openly about certain things. And in short, we can have complete confidence in that we can come to God at any time and He'll receive us into His presence and we can speak openly in His presence. Not because God is our buddy, not because we brought God down to us, but because Christ has made us holy and made us acceptable in His presence. That's why Paul, or that's why the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 3 and verse 1, you are holy brethren, set apart to God. We can draw near to God confidently. This boldness is for us to enter into the holiest of all, into God's presence. What is the means by which we have that boldness? What is the means? Well, it says here in verse 19, by the blood of Jesus, we enter with our high priest who by means of his own blood entered in for us to the immediate presence of God. In chapter 6, um, in verse 20, it says of Jesus, he is the forerunner who for us entered, even Jesus made the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He entered into the holiest of God the holiest uh, place of the Father, uh, and ushers us into the presence of God by His blood. Why? Because His blood takes away our sin, which is an offense to God. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, uh, so that's the means. The blood of Jesus, and also by a new and living way. You see how that breaks down there in verse 19. He says, uh, 
having boldness enter the holiest and then you see the word by how by the blood of jesus by a new and living way which is consecrated for us all right and so what does the word new means well in it means in the in the original language in the greek language it means new in this idea fresh freshly slaughtered is it, it, when they if you read the septuagint the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it would describe the sacrifices of the Old Testament when they were freshly done, like a new sacrifice. And so um, Jesus was freshly slaughtered. In other words, that sacrifice is never old. Uh, his, his way, his, the blood of Jesus is, is never done away with. It is never stale. It is never old. It is never unable to sanctify us. It is never unable to take away our sins. There is nothing new coming because Jesus is the new and living way. And by the way, it's living this. How is it living this freshly slaughtered sacrifice? Well, because Christ is different than every other sacrifice. Whenever the high priest offered a sacrifice, it was dead for good. But Jesus died as our sacrifice and then rose again and became the new and yet living way. They, the, the way to God for us is made by death. But not only death, not only the death of Christ, but it's also made by his life, the resurrection of Christ. And so that is the means uh, by which we enter into the presence of God by the blood of Jesus and by the new and living way. And the making of our entrance is this. Jesus consecrated that new and living way for us. He, he entered through the veil. Or we enter through the veil into the presence of God. What is the veil? It's his flesh. In the temple, the veil separated the holiest place. It, held, it separated where God's presence was manifest. It separated the Holy of Holies from the rest. And only the high priest could enter in and only with the blood of a sacrifice and only once per year. And so what did the veil do? Well, it blocked access to God's presence. Everybody was blocked off from God. And nobody could draw near to God in the truest sense. But our, but our text says here that Jesus' flesh was the veil. What does that mean? It means that as long as Christ was living on this earth in the flesh, the way to God was blocked. But then when Christ died, when his flesh was torn asunder, the way to God was open to us. Christ could not come to the earth and just teach us about God and set an example for how we should live and then leave. No, he had to open the way to God. He had to consecrate the way through the veil, that is, through his flesh, when his flesh was ripped up on the cross and he died for our sins. And the moment he died, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 and 51, the moment he died, he cried out with a loud voice, and the, in the veil, the physical veil in the temple was ripped from top to bottom, opening the way into the holiest. What is the holiest then in our text? It says we have boldness to enter into the holiest. What is that? The holiest translates the word hagios, and, and it simply implies something set apart, something that is therefore different, other than the normal and because in obviously because it's special to the lord now when we were um traveling out west last year not this year but last year we went to a place called devil's tower anybody ever heard of devil's tower it's up in wyoming and it's really cool there's like nothing around and then there's this big i don't know what you call it, it looks like a cylinder fell out of the sky and just stuck in the ground you know it's just this big butte and um and that's not short for beauty, but it's just butte, all right? Uh, but it's a formation. Uh, but anyway, we went to Devil's Tower, and we were there in the month of June. And a lot of people like to go to Devil's Tower and, and climb it. They use ropes and gear. We, we're not that into climbing, but uh, these people use ropes and gear and do that. But nobody was climbing the tower there because it was June. And it's signs everywhere. Uh, and the Devil's Tower, um, according to Native Americans in the area... Uh, they had some sway in, in the area. No one was allowed to climb the Devil's Tower in the month of June because it was sacred and because it was holy. And I don't know why the month of June. I didn't read enough plaques to get that information. Uh, but they, they basically that was banned. And you know what? Native Americans knew what holy means. They knew that meant that the tower was different than any other ground. 
It was different to them. Now, they didn't know what makes something holy. To them, it was maybe, I don't know, the legend of how that thing came to be or, uh, or, or something like that. But really, it is the presence of Almighty God Himself that makes it holy. They didn't know what holy is, but they knew what holy does. Um, and, and it makes something just totally different, totally other. Moses understood this when God talked to him out of a burning bush. And he's talking to God and, and, and God says, put your shoes off your feet. Why? Because you're standing on what? Standing on holy ground. In other words, you can walk with your shoes everywhere else. That's just normal ground. But right here, this ground is different. What made it different? God was there. All right? Um, but... Uh, uh, and, and so God also, you know, he took the Sabbath day and he made it different. There were six days in the week and the seventh day was holy to the Lord. It was different than any other day. They couldn't work on that day. They worshiped on that day. Um, and it was, why? Because it was set apart to the Lord. The temple also was set apart. It was different from any other building in the city of Jerusalem and in the world. Why? Because God chose to put his name there. It was holy. I hold in my Bible, uh, or my hand, uh, the Bible here, and it says on the, on the binding there, you see that? Holy Bible. Why is it holy? Because it is different than every other book that I own. It's different than every other book in the world. There's nothing, nothing in print uh, there's no book that is holy like the Bible is holy. Uh, by the way, when I was in Iwana as a little kid, I took my holy Bible and I whacked one of my friends over the head with it. And uh, being the pastor's son, I always had everybody watching me. And so, uh, like a, a, a gaggle of ladies descended upon me to let me know that uh, this Bible is holy and we don't treat it that way. And guess what? Since that day to this... <laughs> I've been unable to take my Bible and whack someone in the head with it. And uh, even as a, and, and I, I, you can't, don't have to be legalistic about that. I don't put stuff on top of my Bible. I don't, I don't take a stack of books and put my Bible in the middle of it. Uh, it goes on top. Why? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say you have to do it that way. But to me, this is a different book. I can throw any old book in the middle. This one goes on top. Now, that's not in the notes. That's just... Um, beside the point but but the, the idea is the bible is different it's holy because it is god's book it's holy spirit inspired well inside the temple though the temple was set aside as holy but even inside the temple in jerusalem behind the veil was the holy of holies and it was set apart in other words it was more holy than the rest of the temple and it was called the holiest of all why because that is the place um, that was more holy than other, any other place on earth because God's manifest presence was there. So there is something even more holy than that special room, though, uh, in the temple. And that something is God. Is, it's a someone. It's God himself. When Isaiah, the prophet, was transported into the throne room of God, he saw the seraphim, the angels, crying out in praise of God. And one cried to another, Isaiah 6, 3, and said, <clears throat> and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. As R.C. Sproul once said, those angels didn't cry out, Love, love, love. They didn't cry out, Mercy, mercy, mercy. They cried out, Holy, 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 because God's holiness is His defining attribute. His love is a holy love. His mercy is great and it endures forever, but it is a holy mercy. His grace, His omnipotence, His justice, His omniscience, every other attribute of God has this one modifier attached to it, holiness. What does that mean? It means that God is completely other. He is completely different than we are. He's different than anything else. He is completely above and outside of creation. He is not like us. And uh, I, saw, I saw one of the dumbest things I've ever seen this, this week. And I, I've been around a while. I've, uh, I've seen some pretty dumb things. Um, there's a seminary in New York City called Union Theological Seminary. Once upon a time, it was a good seminary till about 130 years ago. So it's been a bad seminary for a long time. Last week in Union Theological Seminary, they had a chapel service. You know what they did for the chapel service? They brought in potted plants and they knelt down and prayed to those plants. 
and ask the plant's forgiveness for the way they've treated them. Now, can you imagine? This is a seminary that calls itself Christian, all right? But what it is is paganism, worshiping and serving the creature more than the creator. Why in the world would you offer prayers to a plant? And then, I don't know what they ate afterwards, because such people probably aren't eating meat. Why would you do that? Well, they think those plants have some kind of holiness to them. Why? They don't understand what is holy. They don't under understand that God is outside of his creation, that he's completely other. And the moment that you take your eyes off the holiness of God, anything is possible. Any sin is possible. Any lunacy is possible. Anything messed up is possible. When we take our eyes off of the holiness of God, He is not like us. He is not like the plants and animals of this world. He's above that. He's better than that. And deserving of all of our worship. Yes, we bear the image of God, but God is not one of us. He became human, but He became a sinless, perfect human being. We will become holy. We will be glorified. We will become just like Him. The Bible says someday we'll see Him as He is. But until that day, uh, we're, we're not exactly like Him. Uh, I say all that to say this. Jesus gives us boldness, absolute confidence to enter into God's very presence. We could, have, we could not have confidence this way if we had our confidence in ourselves. As if, as, excuse me, as if to say, um, we're, we're good enough. We have to be good enough uh, to go to Him. That's confidence in ourselves and that doesn't work. Our confidence, our boldness is founded in Christ and in His work. And so when we, when we don't even feel like it, Christ's work still stands in God's presence on our behalf. You ever just not feel like it? <laughs> you ever just not feel like uh, if I pray God's even going to care? <laughs> Or, uh, or maybe I haven't been good enough to pray. Or, or I, I, I just can't draw near to God in this relationship because, man, I'm just, I'm just not feeling it. I just haven't, I haven't, I haven't uh, I just, just uh, been feeling the Spirit or something like that. You know what? God's faithfulness does not depend on our feelings. It depends on the finished work of Jesus Christ that brings us and ushers us into the holiest of all and so god jesus equips us to draw near to god by giving us this holy boldness what other equipment do we get well secondly jesus gives us he equips us here with holy representation holy representation look at verse 21 um, it says and having an high priest over the house of god that's a that's a that's a little verse packed with a lot of truth and I'll try to keep it as short as possible so your roasts don't burn this afternoon. But, um, but it says we have a high priest over the house of God. A priest. What is a priest? He's a mediator. He works on behalf of man to make man accepted in the presence of God. And how does he do that? Well, a priest... See, I'm a, I'm a pastor. There's a difference between a pastor and a priest. A pastor preaches a message. Um, you might come by to visit if you got good food and coffee. Um, he, uh, uh, you know, a pastor does certain things, right? Prays, uh, should study a little bit. What does a priest do? Priest, I can't make you acceptable to God. I can't do it. It's not in my power. A priest makes us acceptable to God. How he does this, not by lowering God's standards so that we're good enough. He does this by offering a sacrifice, an atoning sacrifice that washes away our sins. And it says that Jesus uh, made this way by his blood. He offered himself as a sacrifice. And, and he did this uh, once for all, once for all. Um, and, and so one sacrifice of Christ has been offered. Now, uh, it says he's high priest over the house of God. What does that mean? What is the house of God? Well, oftentimes in the Bible, when you read of the house of God, it, it refers to the temple. But in Hebrews, the house of God is the church. Uh, and, and not the church building, but the church people. 
Uh, Christians are the house of God. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6, if you flip back a couple of pages, in chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. We are the house of God. Christians are the house of God. Um, we are the temple of God now through the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If you are in the church, you're in the house of God. If you are in the house of God, Christ is your mediator. How do you get into the church? You receive Christ as your Savior, your Lord, your King. He washes away your sins by faith. You receive Him and He becomes your Savior and He becomes at the same time your mediator. Christ is the only mediator, by the way. In the, the people to whom the book of Hebrews was first written were Jewish people in the first century who had become Christians and received Jesus as their Lord, their Savior, their Messiah. But at the same time, they had come out of a culture where they had to uh, put their faith in a priest who would offer sacrifices on their behalf. And basically the whole book of Hebrews is written to say, stop doing that. Jesus is your mediator. You don't need a human priest anymore. Don't go back to that. And the temptation for them was to go back to this Jewish priestly system. And Jesus is saying, that's over. Christ has made one sacrifice. There is only one mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. This is the word of God. Listen to the word of God. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. No other. One mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Why? Verse 6. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified of in due time. You can only go to God through Jesus Christ. There's only one God. There's only one mediator. Only Jesus Christ made an atoning sacrifice for our sins. No saint did that. Mary, you know, Mary the mother of Jesus, she didn't make an atoning sacrifice for your sins. She couldn't and, and they couldn't. Only Jesus. And so um, what mediators do we seek to go through? Some people want to go through a saint or through a holy person or some, some representative. Some people seek self-representation. Now this is a bad idea, self-representation. You ever seen somebody do that in court? Usually they're insane when they do that, right? Um, self-representation in a, in a human court is a bad idea. How much worse is it in God's court? This exposes great pride in both instances. Um, Self-representation says, God, you have to take me as I am. You should anyway because I've done such good works. Could you imagine saying that to God? And so only Christ has given himself as a sacrifice. And because of that, if you go to God through Christ, you have complete access to God. The holy representation of Christ equips us to draw near to God. And that's what He wants. That should be what we want too. More than anything. What other equipment is given to us? I'll give you the last one. Jesus equips us. He gives us a holy conscience. A holy conscience. So not only a holy boldness and a holy priest, but a holy conscience. In verse 22, he says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Our hearts sprinkled and our bodies washed from an evil conscience. And so... Our holy conscience comes by a cleansing of our inner selves. It says our hearts are sprinkled. Um, in, in the Old Testament, uh, again, this is, this is referring to some, some uh, different uh, rituals in the Old Testament. But the idea here is the inner self is cleansed. Uh, conscience condemns us and it reminds us of our guilt. And guilt cannot be removed until the sin is removed a lot of people try to remove guilt by changing the definition of sin by by making trying to make it as if sin is not sin that, do, that really doesn't work uh, but guilt cannot be removed until sin is removed when jesus died his blood removes our sins and 
when we embrace him by faith, when we receive Christ as our Savior, our conscience becomes free of guilt. We are cleansed from an evil conscience, one that condemns us, and we do not condemn ourselves anymore. Our conscience is clear because our sins are removed. You know, conscience um, works in our spirit and in our mind like pain works in our bodies. And so if there's something wrong with your body, pain tells you, right? There's actually a disease where you can't feel pain and a lot of people get injured with that. Um, and so a conscience, when there is something wrong, tells us. And it's kind of like a painful experience. And that's good, but the cure for an evil conscience is to have the sin removed. All right? And so that comes by Christ and by the cleansing of our conscience. In the Old Testament ceremonies, the priests would uh, be sprinkled with blood. The, the, the priest would go into the holiest of all. He'd have blood sprinkled all over him from, the, from the, the sacrifice in order to be cleansed. Also, the priests would wash themselves ritually with water. There were lavers full of water that they would wash themselves before they performed their, their services. These, these ceremonies were only really a picture of the reality. In reality, Christ in Christ, we are completely washed and clean in God's eyes. Because of that, our conscience does not condemn us. It's clean. It's clear. And we're enabled by the power of the Spirit. Our conduct and our conscience becomes more and more holy. Um, it's difficult to get near to someone if you know that in your heart that there's something between you. You ever had that happen? Something between you and somebody else? Something not right. Something that's your fault. That keeps you from having the just really good fellowship. Makes it tense. Makes it awkward um, to some extent. But in Christ, we have nothing between us and God. God wants us to draw near to Him, to Himself. How do we know that? Well, He exhorts us to draw near. He says, let us draw near. It's pretty, pretty simple. Commanded. And then he equips, he equips us to draw near. He gives us this. In Christ, Jesus gives us a holy boldness, a holy priest, a holy representation, and a holy conscience. When we were making plans to travel out west uh, for vacation here, and some of these things have to be planned a long time in advance. I give my wife credit for that. I don't do any of that planning, but... Anyway, there's a, there's a place out west called the Wave. I think it's a canyon. It's called the Wave because the formation of the rock, it just looks like waves. It's beautiful. Lots of people want to go there. The problem is, uh, well, maybe it's not a problem. It's probably a good thing. They only allow 20 people in to that area at a time in, on, in one day. So 20 people per day can go in. Uh, and so in order to be one of the 20 people, you've got to sign up plenty in advance. But not only that, when you sign up plenty in advance, I'm talking months in advance, when you sign up, they put your name into a lottery. And then they draw 20 people per day. We lost. <laughs> and, and we went to that visitor center, and there were lots of people coming out looking disappointed and making alter, alternate plans because their names were not drawn. 20 people were drawn to go in on that day. Could you imagine entering that lottery months in advance, getting your name drawn, paying the money for the permits, and then not going? I mean, the odds of getting drawn are pretty bleak. It's called a lottery for a good reason, I guess. Um, but the odds are pretty bad. And could you imagine, yeah, getting, getting drawn for that and then not going and seeing the, the beauty of, of the wave, the, the canyon there? Well, you know what? God offers us something better than a lottery. Something where the access really is more impossible, but God makes it possible through Jesus Christ. He offers uh, sure and complete access to himself. And in his presence is the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Sadly, many Christians don't seem bothered by that. They don't seem bothered by the fact that they should draw near, they're commanded to draw near, they're equipped to draw near, and they just don't want to draw near. Why is that? We ought to draw near to God and understand that in His presence is the fullness of joy. So there are some practical ways to draw near to God. First one makes is, is the biggest deal. And that is this. You must be saved. You must be born again. 
A religious leader came to Jesus by night and said, uh, we know your teacher come from God because of all these miracles, John chapter 3. Jesus says to Nicodemus, the leader, spiritual leader, he says, you must be born again. Something has to happen. It has to be a miracle of God. You must be saved. You can never draw near to God if you have sin on your account. God does not abide the presence of sin. You can't draw near to God until you repent and turn to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, the Bible says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's said, Be reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You cannot enter into the holy presence of God unless you have his righteousness. Ours isn't good enough. And so Christ died so that if you would receive him as your Savior, you will have his righteousness in yourself and be reconciled to God. And so, um, you know, that's, you can't draw near to God without being saved. If you're not saved this morning, if you're not a child of God born again, let me know after this service. I will gladly take the Bible, take the gospel, and show you how you can know Christ is your Savior this morning. And know for without a shadow of a doubt that you are going into the presence of God when you die, and that you have the presence of God as you live. Another, just one more practical way is just spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines. In other words, prayer. We have bold access to God. That means freedom of speech. Talk to Him. Pray. Come to God. And you don't have to do anything special, but bow your head and your heart and pray and ask God for what you need. Pray and praise God for what He's given. Pray and pour out your heart to God for what troubles you. Pray. Read His Word. Meditate on it. And... Uh, Draw near to God. He calls us to. He equips us to. He and 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 uh, desires us to. Let's stand together.